room and you guys are just staring there. We're waiting for people to arrive. I think you're muted, Dad. Ah, oh, I just see Charlie send us a note on the chat. Great. All right, everyone I believe does have a voice. We're just waiting a couple more moments for uh, people to filter in and then we'll get started. Okay, I think probably that's enough time. All right, um, greetings everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us this evening uh, for a conversation with Scott McDonald and Jacqueline Stewart on their book, William Greaves, Filmmaking as Mission. I'm Bryce Lucas. I'm with the Seminary Co-op Bookstores in Chicago, and I'll say just a few words to get us started. Uh, as you may know, the Seminary Co-op is the first and only not-for-profit bookstore whose mission is bookselling. That mission recognizes bookstores as fundamental civic institutions, and it allows us to work with like-minded partners on events like this one. On that subject, we're very happy to be partnering for this evening's event with the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at the University of Chicago. Uh, let me now introduce our authors. Uh, Scott McDonald is the author of the series A Critical Cinema, Interviews with Independent Filmmakers, which is in five volumes from the University of California Press. And he is the author of many other books, most recently Avant Doc, Intersections of Documentary and Avant-Garde Cinema, uh, Bimington uh, Babylon, Voices from the Cinema Department, The Flaherty, Decades in the Cause of Independent Cinema, and The Sublimity of Document, Cinema as Diorama. Uh, he has curated film events at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Anthology Film Archives, the Pompidou Center, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Pacific Film Archive, the Harvard Film Archive, and other venues. He, uh, Scott teaches film history at Hamilton College. Uh, Jacqueline Stewart is professor in the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago and Chief Artistic and Programming Officer at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. She is author of Migrating to the Movies and co-editor of the LA Rebellion, Creating a New Black Cinema, both available from University of California Press. With Charles Musser, she curated the DVD collection Pioneers of African American Cinema for Kino Lorber. She's the host of Silent Sunday Nights on Turner Classic Movies. Uh, we're so very happy to have both of you with us virtually this evening. Uh, I'll make one final note on format. Uh, the chat will be open. Uh, we also encourage you uh, to put any questions you have into the Q&A uh, section at the bottom of the screen. Those, uh, there will be time to answer those at the end of the event. Um, without uh, any further ado, I turn it over to our authors. Thanks, Brian. Thank, thank you. And thanks, Seminary Co-op. And thanks, uh, CSRPC. It's really meaningful. To, this is our book. This is our first book event. So no, it really no. means a lot to me that we're doing this in the company of University of Chicago folks. And I'm seeing in the chat a lot of our contributors are in the room with us tonight. So it's such a pleasure. And great to see you, Scott, because we've been working remotely <laughs> for a long time now. Yeah. I don't think we even knew the book would be out already. So it's like, it's it's a surprise to have this book launch, and it's great to have the book actually in the Here world. It is. Here yes, it is. Yes, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> so we can toast books. Um, you know, just before we started, Scott and I, we were trying to remember when we began our conversations about the book, and I think it was at, at SCMS, maybe 2017, um, and you approached me, and you know, just with dismay and kind of like uh indignance that that William Greaves had never received the kind of critical attention that he deserved and uh you know I immediately agreed with you and as you began to map out the many dimensions of his work and we learned more as we you know embarked on this project sure I realized that I I thought I knew a lot about William Greaves um but that I just you know only knew a very small part of the story, or rather some isolated aspects of his, um, yeah. his creative output. Um, I mean, I, I was probably most familiar with his work 
as the executive producer of Black Journal, the landmark Black public affairs television show, um, Emmy award-winning program that really set the stage for all kinds of local iterations of, um, of responding to the Kerner Commission report and giving Black people a space sometimes very late at night, but on television to really explore the issues that were most relevant to us from our perspectives. And so his work there, uh, I was quite familiar with. And then I also knew that he had been an actor in the very last of the race movies, uh, these black cast films for segregated black audiences. So his acting career, I knew just involved some of those very kind of late 1940s productions like Souls of Sin um, from 1949 and Miracle in Harlem from 1948. But I guess I just assumed that he had kind of like stopped acting and wanted to get behind the camera. I guess I also knew that he had to study filmmaking in Canada, that he had not received the opportunities in the U.S. to, you know, pursue film training. Right because of the segregation of the industry and the real repression of, um, of entrance of Black people into, you know, formally into the film industry, working uh, as writers and directors and producers. Yeah. But I, I, I had never been able to connect all the dots. And so when you kind of launched this idea that we would engage in much deeper scholarship on him and, uh, and I believe you were also, you know, already really closely in touch with Louise Greaves, Bill's uh, widow, who worked with him and who uh, has really been the archivist of, of his work. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny because you knew a lot about Bill when I knew nothing at all. Um, and it's funny because I, I was just remembering Terry Francis's blurb on the book where um, she's talking about Bill. But one a filmmaker who until now has been hidden within his immense productivity, mm. uh, which I think is really true. He was so involved in making work yeah. that making himself known was not something he had time for. Uh, but I, I learned about Bill at a 1991 Robert Flaherty seminar. Uh, when he came to show Symbiopsychotaxiplasm Take One. Mm. And it was one or the, of the two or three most dramatic moments I ever remember. I go to those, went to those seminars for many years. But the power of that film, the shock of that film, which had been made in 1970, shot in 68 and the yes. first version in 71 or 72, yeah. and then had disappeared for 20 years, uh, until it was rediscovered by the Brooklyn Museum. And then this Flaherty event happens a couple of months after that. We were all blown away. We had, we had not seen anything like this. The idea that this film had been out and alive and nobody had seen it was like mm -hmm. shocking to me. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was such, you know, my, my earliest interest in film was avant-garde filmmaking. And here was one of the incredible masterworks of avant-garde filmmaking uh, that I had never heard of. And I had been working in the field for decades by that time. So mm -hmm. it just, I was outraged at my own ignorance, kind of. And other people, everybody at the Flaherty, nobody knew about this at all. I mean, there were people, Bill had been at the Flaherty a number of times with earlier work. Um, but everybody there was like, oh my God, this is such an incredible thing. And yeah. the irony is, um, that for all the work Bill did, and he, he never stopped working, uh, Symbio ends up, ironically, here's a film that was found in a box in a closet in 1990, or 1991, mm -hmm. and then blew its way back into the world. Um, it, it, that's become the way in which most of us have been reintroduced the way you you were re I was re I was introduced by that film. You were reintroduced by that film to this incredible career. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it got to be very exciting to to work on it because everything I saw was new for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you had much more of a background in it than I did. Yeah. Well, the Symbio project, which is many years and many iterations, right. um, I really had a hard time understanding how to fit that into 
the pieces of the puzzle that, you know, that I was familiar with um, in terms of Greaves' career. You know, the first time I taught Symbio, I taught it in intro to film class. It's the, the first time, the only time I've had students ask to watch the film again, like as soon as it was over, because um, they were really riveted by the structure of the film. And I think, you know, we were talking about film authorship and uh, this really radical way that he's presenting himself in that film as a director. Uh, but for me now, I understand that this is a, a really important way of uh, connecting his work as an actor and an acting teacher, right? So learning more about the fact that he was one of the earliest participants in the actor studio right. um, and that he taught method acting for many, many years. Right. Um, it just adds an, an entirely new dimension to the ways that we can see, not just the way that he interacts with, you know, talent in his films, but rather his whole approach to a kind of improvisation and, um, and intuitiveness um, and kind of like uh, his interest in, in, in psychology, right? <laughs> like he's, he's consistently trying to figure out how to evoke that even in nonfiction or documentary forms. Right. And he's trying across his career to figure out the best ways to communicate to viewers um, and doing that in a way that is deeply engrossing in terms of like intellectual appeal and emotional appeal. Mm -hmm. No. Um, so the Symbio project is really, it's just, you know, it seems anomalous, I guess, formally in, in the surviving, you know, Greaves body of work, but actually it's, it, it, it connects all of the dots. Yeah, I, I think, think that's true. It's, uh, and it's kind of a culmination of, Bill always thought of himself as an educator, that mm -hmm. his mission was to show people all the many ways in which especially African-Americans had contributed to American culture and were contributing to American culture that were ignored or, or played down or not shown on the media. Um, so he was, he was always educative. And at a certain point, I think he realized, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a yeah. filmmaker of a certain kind and I need to educate people about what the filmmaking process feels like, what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think to go into Central Park with uh, a bunch of actors and to set up this crazed situation outside of the normal, uh, you know, money making world of Manhattan uh, mm. was very liberating for him. I mean, he had done so many projects where you had to you had to show a specific you had to make clear something that he knew and that people needed to know. Right. This was like a romp in a certain way. I mean, he could mm. really explore what he had discovered. And as you say, about acting, but also about the psychology of actors, the psychology between filmmakers and actors. Uh, so it's an incredible, uh, it's an incredible experience, Symbio. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that as we were coming up with the structure of the book, you had the brilliant idea to have a dossier of writings about symbiocytotaxoplasm. Take one, and then the ways he was thinking about it, take two, the development of what became two and a half, because you know he sort of lived with this project for a long time, even though he was, you know, I think demoralized by the fact that it wasn't received in the ways he hoped it would uh, when he first edited it. From what I understand, we understand he there was a screening at, was it at Cannes? It can, yeah, and they screwed and up the, the reels. Reels were out of order. And uh, so something that was already kind of hard to wrap your brain around <laughs> really became impossible to see in the with the impact that he wanted it to have. And so, yeah, he put it in a closet and it was too painful, right, for him to go back to that the, the risks that he was taking with that project. So in this dossier of writings about Symbio that we have in the book, we also include a lot of Greaves' own writings about the project, you know, personal um, working out of how he was going to construct this. And if I could read one of these, I guess the first one, I just want to read the, the beginning of it, um, sure. because this is one of my favorite, I think, components of the book. Bill Greaves uh, wrote out a proposal, which he called theatrical short subject. <laughs> 
And then he mailed it to himself, right? So this was the way of kind of, you know, protecting the idea, you know, this kind of like casual copywriting uh, uh, strategy. Um, and I think the ways that he outlines his concept for this really illuminate the depth of the, um, the interventions that he was trying to make in terms of the, you know, the impact that he wanted this film to have. So he writes um, basic concept. There is a tremendous unstated need on the part of audiences for a new cinematic language, one in which a more total statement of reality can be made. A language which on the one hand brings the viewer more intimately into the inner mental operations of the creative cinema artist, while at the same time illuminates the inner operations of the human psyche as it struggles with the basic problems of social existence. A language whose intimacy catapults the viewer into a state of consciousness that broadens his perceptions and perspectives of social issues, which are fiercely rocking the boat of what could become a great society. A language whose essence of sheer theatricality is created out of the fresh and innovative use of camera, director, actor, and script. It is this sort of cinema language which I would like to apply to this theatrical short as opposed to the more conventional documentary or travelogue approach currently in use. My film would be simultaneously cinema verite, documentary, avant-garde, dramatic. Let me explain. The documentary aspect of my short shows how a film crew, actors, and a director go about the business of shooting a film on location, of penetrating human character, of applying the laws of aesthetics to the motion picture image and sound. The dramatic aspect of the film will be found not only in the themes of marital strife, homosexuality, and social responsibility, which form the basis of the dramatic story being filmed, but also there will be drama in the struggle which takes place on the part of the actors, the director and crew to heighten the reality and dramatic intensity of their work. The cinema verite aspect guarantees a spontaneity in the shooting with its candid camera grasp of the before the lens, behind the lens drama. Audience response to this kind of filmmaking is highly simpatico. The avant-garde aspect, which will include not only the synthesis of documentary, dramatic, and cinema verite, but also the extensive use of improvisation technique in the work of the actors and director, extensive use by the director slash cameraman and cameraman of the close-up and the extreme close-up, the several levels of reality which will simultaneously and theatrically bombard the viewer the physical shooting of a film, the dramatic story, the actor's technical and creative problems and characterization, the filmmaker's struggle for a new, more effective cinema language. A Negro director whose unique presence gives an added social dimension to the film as he and his crew spontaneously break into the dramatic action as they pursue their work, the director digging, probing a la actor studio method to get top performances from his actors. And finally, the whole undertaking should have the flavor of a happening cinema style. So he is just laying out so eloquently all of the dimensions, the layers of his training as an artist, right. but also just laying out on the table just all of the vulnerabilities of being a filmmaker and a Negro filmmaker, which he almost places as an aside there. Yeah, um, right to create this happening, this cinema happening. So it, it, it has the marks of its moment, right? Of the late 1960s, but it's also so prescient. And, and at the same time, it, it's resonating with some of the foundational theoretical questions of what constitutes cinema, right? And, and the ways that, that cinema speaks as a specific medium. It's, you know, just really extraordinary. One, one of the ironies, and I, I think, what you said was true that this experience at Khan of having, you know, having a version of this film finally finished and then showing it to a programmer who he knew and, and who admired him and hearing that it made no sense the, the mm. uh, Louis Mackerel just had no idea what this was. I'm sure it did. It was a painful experience for him, but I think ironically, he was so busy doing yeah. so he was such a worker. No, he didn't have time. He didn't have time to to sit around and moan about, oh my God, my film, nobody, nobody gives a damn about my film. He had to get back to work. Yeah. And so when Dara Myers Kingsley 
sees the box with the film in it in a closet when she's looking at all his films for this Brooklyn Ret Book and Museum retrospective. She sees the film. He says, oh, don't bother with that. He's, he's left it so far behind, yes. you know? So, and here it comes, this unbelievable masterwork of 60s and what whenever cinema. I mean, it's mm. a remarkable thing. Yeah. Um, when you were reading, I was thinking, um, Cinema Verite was very important to him. Uh, I talked a lot about it, although unlike Penny Baker and the Maisels brothers and other better known Cinema Verite filmmakers, he didn't have a mode of making that he then looked for subjects that he could use to reveal it. Yes. That is that the, the, the particular approach didn't come first. For mm -hmm. him, what he wanted to educate people about came first. Uh, and then Cinema Verite was a method where, in many cases, he could make that happen. Mm -hmm. And I, the, second, the little comment I wanted to mention was in an interview he did with a, a pair of Germans who had had spent a lot of time with one of his one of his films, uh, and he's describing how Cinema Verite works because they're they're wondering what exactly does Cinema Verite mean to you? And he says, um, they 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 ask, they make the statement, we thought it was an aesthetic decision. And Bill says, the reality of what you're filming mandates your aesthetic decisions. If you surrender to the truth, cosmic reality takes over. It's a philosophical, mystical kind of thing. One has to surrender to the divine, to the subconscious, to the reality of the cosmos, you've got to let go. You must not try to manage the brilliant piece of creation that is the human experience. There's nothing you can do to augment it. One of the wonderful things about cinema verite filmmaking is that you can catch absolutely breathtaking moments of human behavior that you could never preconceive or get an actor to replicate. Mm. So he was all about changing the way people understood the world, yeah. uh, all about communicating to people, uh, even about crucial figures in the culture that, that had been forgotten uh, by the time he's making the films, Ralph Bunch, for example. Yes. Uh, but still, as dedicated as he was to communicating information and changing thought, he, and Symbio is the perfect instance of this, he lets, lets go within, he sets up a situation and then lets it go where it goes. Yeah. Uh, and the result is, is when it's good, it's remarkable. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But it's really important also that he... Um, that he doesn't entirely erase himself, right? Like there are certainly um, aspects of the films that he made about African-American political, cultural history, um, when he's capturing images that make it clear that it matters that it's him, you know, in the cinema situation capturing these things and that he, uh, he's aware of the importance of his, his presence. So there's this kind of simultaneous effacement and presence there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really important to note too that he was, you know, so often his own producer, director, often the writer, just masterful cameraman. So, you know, for Symbio, he's a he's cameraman slash director. That's how he describes himself uh, in some of the descriptions of the project. Yeah. Uh, so his eye in the moment of shooting but then also the ways that then he's gonna really guide the editing process. Uh, it's just remarkable that he, he's existing in multiple temporalities in these projects um, in ways that I think, you know, he's trained to do in the work that he did as a cinema, a part of this, you know, first North American unit of uh, cinema verite filmmakers when he was working with the National Film Board of Canada. Um, he's hoping to develop what cinema verite is going to be and then he carries those experiences, including just like the sheer stamina, right, of shooting in that way, Incredible. Um, which he did for decades. Yeah. And I mean, you and I are not the only ones that are tuning into Greece. I mean, at long last, Nation Time Gary has been preserved. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, the big one of the big ironies is the first film about the Ali Frazier boxing match, which was the yeah. biggest sporting event in the world at the time. He made the, the best and most complete film about that moment. And it's still waiting for a real mm -hmm. release. I mean, there's so much of his work 
that's still trying to pull itself out of obscurity when yes. we know there's audience for it. You know, it's like yeah. uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the Ali Frazier film can get a release before too long now. It's time. No, I hope so. No, I mean, that's, we certainly hope that with this book, with this attention, that there will be more of that kind of, you know, Right. <laughs> liberation <laughs> of some of this work because there's so many rights issues that become involved. We're so happy that we have, uh, you know, an entry in the book toward the end by Shala Lynch, who is, um, you know, the film curator at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, where Greaves is massive, and I mean like mass warehouses full of material. Right. Um, the films, you know, the raw material for the films, the research for this huge body of work, um, which she is shepherding, you know, in terms of its preservation. And, yeah. you know, there are films that we couldn't get to that we're hoping other people will write about that curators, programmers will really pay more attention to this work and that more and more of it will be preserved. Because, you know, as we've been saying, we've only gotten very small pieces of his story um, and looking at the work, I think is the most powerful way to really apprehend what it was um, that he was trying to do across his lifetime of, of creative practice. Yeah. I mean, in our preface, we do have a section that says, take one, because <laughs> yes. we know that this is, I mean, it's a big book. Uh, I'm very proud of it. I mean, I think we, we I'm, I think we did a really nice job. And I think Columbia did a really nice job with yeah. it. It's a beautiful book. But it's just take one. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so much work that he did that's not included in the book that we're just hoping that this is a, you know, a catalyst for an ongoing process. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And we should also just, yeah, make sure that people know that um, there's also more information about Greaves' work on the website. Right. Uh, WilliamGreaves.com uh, that Louise Greaves and Sue Friedrich worked on together to update sort of in, during the same time that we were That's right. compiling the book. Um, he just you get a real sense of and you know maybe a more visual sense of the range of work that Bill Greaves created through his own you know production company. Yeah. Um, the importance of maintaining his own independent business practice alongside you know all of the aesthetic innovations that he was creating i know it's a rare it's a rare avant-garde experimental documentarian that decides okay i'm gonna make a living making independent films mm -hmm. you know what i mean i'm not going to be part of any company i so they he and louise ran ran the show and stayed alive and put kids through college. it's amazing what they can yeah. what they were able to do i think yeah yeah and it's cool to think about how the you know the realms of educational film sponsored film you know he was making films for the usia you know the united nations that was a project that first brought him back to the us the eeoc um and you might think when you hear those names, you know, well, these are just going to be kind of conventional or whatever. You might make all kinds of assumptions about what they look like or their, their, how their political missions are reflected in, you know, um, in their in their style and their impact. But he is just such an important example of really looking at how uh, an artist could use that space to really do much more expansive things um yeah. one might imagine and and see this confluence of sort of non-theatrical realms of sponsored work and avant-garde practice yeah yeah do you think maybe Whoa. we should open this up yeah we us? should yeah there must be people I'd out love there to see some questions, questions. oh i'm just clicking on the q a okay <laughs> Here's Corey Creekmer. Hey, Corey. <laughs> and he says, I can't wait to see the book, but I'm wondering if it clarifies the role as credited production assistant Kathleen Collins played in the making of Symbio or the working relationship between Collins and William Greaves more generally. That's, that, that is proof of our take one point. No, it yeah. does not. It does not. Uh, and there are so many aspects of Bill's career that the book doesn't have space to cover. Mm -hmm. I'm learning. I'm learning. I, I was at a uh, at a gig at University of Colorado Boulder 
um, a few months ago and um, talking about talking about Symbio. Uh, Aaron Espoli had shown Symbio uh, and a man named uh, Chris Osborne uh, came, came on to the Zoom conversation and he was Bill's assistant on a number of films. Mm -hmm. uh, and he told me, and I mean, some people listening will, will get this, that Bill knew about Michael Snow, the avant-garde filmmaker, mm -hmm. didn't think much of his work, and I think there's a very good chance that the, the, the sound that, that Symbio opens with and closes with, that rising sine wave sound, might be a conscious allusion to, to Michael Snow's wavelength. Huh. Uh, I wow. mean, there are, there are connections in so many different directions that need to be mined. I mean, this, yes. this is a career that, so Kathleen Collins, I mean, she's mentioned in the book, She's she certainly somebody her. that he mentored. We knew that, mm -hmm. uh, but the specifics of it, no, we no. We, uh, we don't have that in the book. No. We wish we did. No. We need to duck, try to find, find that out. Yeah. There's another question kind of related to this one. Would you say something about the people Greaves worked with on Symbio? People such as Audrey Henningham, Shannon Baker, Bob Rosen, Jonathan Gordon. Were they part of his circle, just engaged for this project? Um, and we know some of them were folks that he uh, worked with uh, the studio. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that project that, I mean, as uh, Kason and Jaji say in their article in the book, uh, that's a project that continued to evolve over 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the film disappeared into a box uh, in a closet, but then once it got released, it continued to generate more and more attention, finally got a theatrical release. Uh, and Buscemi and Soderbergh get involved uh, yep. to help make Symbio take two and a half. And Bill brings back the same, a same pair of actors that appeared in 1968, 30 yes. years later as themselves and as their characters. That's you know, right. it's like, who does that? Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and it remained controversial, right? I mean, some of the participants in the film uh, continue to raise the same kinds of, uh, you know, <laughs> suspicions and doubts and, um, and questions about whether or not Bill knew what he was doing <laughs> or where the, where the center of the film actually existed. Uh, so yeah, these are really long-standing relationships, maybe. Well, that's why it's so, so important that to have that piece in the book that you read from the, the, the ideas that he had for this film originally. You know? Yeah, uh, yep. because there can be no doubt he knew what he was doing. So anyway. All right. There's a question about a film that uh, Greaves made for the Social Security Administration in 1974. You've got a number. Um, and the question is, did Greaves make other films that incorporated animation? And I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Ooh, um, Nothing's coming to my mind. Yeah, nor to mine. Um, yeah, don't know. Don't know. No, not sure about that. Um, our dear friend, Patty Zimmerman, um, and contributor to the book, is wondering if we can elaborate more on the role of Louise Archambault, who had been a frequent collaborator on his projects. What were the dimensions of their working relationship? What was her role across his career? Well, I, I, uh, Louise, oh my goodness. Um, one well, I can say, you know, one thing I say, I can say super quickly is that um, we, we always want to honor and praise Louise. And we're also aware of the fact that she's not always comfortable with that. In fact, she's rarely comfortable with it. So this is a tricky one to answer because in our hearts, we would want to say a ton of things about Louise, but we're also mindful of the fact that, um, uh, that attention is something that is, is you know, not always desired, in fact, almost never desired by her. Well, I, I would say that Bill, like many of us men, grew, grew, expanded our awareness of the importance of the women in our lives over our lifetimes. Uh, and one of the ways in which I think it's evident in, even in 
Symbio when it was re-released, when he tweaked it when, for the re-release, the first person we hear talk in that film is Luis. Yes. So, and as he got near the end of his life, he talk, they were, they were co-producers. They did everything together. Louise made sure the films got out into the world and she is still doing that. Yes. I mean, she is a formidable human being. Um, she had COVID and survived. <laughs> you know, it's like she is a formidable woman. Uh, and there's no question that together they were a hell of a team. I think for the most part, they were too busy getting the films out mm. to, to think about themselves or even to think about each other other than as a working pair, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. We, we dedicated the book to Louise because uh, she was incredibly generous all the way through the process and continues to be. No, absolutely. Yes. And when you think about just what it took to maintain that independence of their production company, and I say their production company, um, uh, she was such a key sort of business partner in, in, in creating this work and in, in finding ways to sort of survive from one project to the next. Um, yep. So, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, there's a question from Susan Ivers. She says she greatly respects us both. That's very nice. The question is, what do you most admire about Greaves' approach to his life's work? the combining of seemingly disparate projects like Black Journal and avant-garde filmmaking into a highly unique, integrated, mission-driven career. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we see and we talk about in the intro is that, you know, Greaves could have continued to pursue a career uh, as an actor. He had had some, you know, Broadway roles. Um, there are various moments when he could have taken a commercial route in his in his artistic life. Um, but instead he was committed both to the mission of using filmmaking to, uh, to educate, as you were saying, Scott, but also really explicitly as part of the black liberation struggle writ large. Yeah. Um, and recognizing that uh, he would have to find these niches and <laughs> these pockets of kind of institutional collaboration to maintain the flexibility for that kind of political project. So mm -hmm. he's just immensely cre creative in every dimension of his work, including in these creating the kind of business framework that would allow him to keep that artistic and, and political uh, autonomy. Um, that's what I most admire yeah. about him. Yeah, I mean, he could have been, he wrote a hundred songs when he was a young person and had many of them recorded by what were then major recording artist. Mm -hmm. He could have been a dancer. He could have been a Broadway actor. He was a Broadway actor. But I think unlike most filmmakers that we admire, he wasn't, he wasn't about his own career. He was dedicated to the idea that making films should help change the world in a positive direction. He was totally dedicated to that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's a rare being uh, that makes that the goal and sacrifices everything that would come from taking a different route in order to to do that goal that he would become you know growing up in a place where you couldn't even get training in documentary filmmaker that he would become the most prolific uh one of the most prolific filmmakers of his era and uh a remarkably prolific documentary filmmaker it's amazing you know it's just remarkable yeah 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 well, those are the questions so far, unless someone wants to. Yeah. Oh, someone is sharing. Yes, Michelle Duster is with us tonight. Hey, awesome. Michelle. And Michelle contributed an incredible story about the making of a film about her grandmother, Ida B. Wells, her great grandmother, excuse me, Ida B. Wells. Um, and uh, Michelle worked as a, like a production assistant on that film and just gives this first person testimony to uh, what it was like to see Bill Greaves embark on one of his projects and just yeah. how deeply respectful he was. Oh, Patty just put it here. Thank you, Patty. Um, <laughs> he did a film about my great grandmother, Ida B. Wells. I had a chance to work on it with him. I can say that he had a lot of respect for his topic and was very inclusive of our family and took great care of the material. 
It was almost like he became a member of our family and kept in touch with several members of our family for decades. It's really powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And just thinking about, it kind of gets back to what I was saying about the significance of Greaves as a Black filmmaker holding the camera when he is making this work about Black lives and history. He was cultivating trust. I mean, this is a huge component of making this kind of work meaningful. Um, and, you know, he starts making films when it was just so incredibly rare for Black subject matter to get this kind of treatment and even more rare for Black artists to be making that work and doing it in a way that it could be circulated to Black communities, let alone a broader public. Yeah. So um, it's really fantastic to see uh, and hear Michelle's reflections on how deeply he was engaging with the family and um, and how respectful he was. It's clear that's clear across the work that he's creating. We can imagine he was forming similar relationships yeah. with people. Uh, Michelle's piece reminds me that one of the things that we knew we had to do when we were putting the book together is to try to represent the multi multifaceted nature of this very long career. Uh, so you know, there are interviews with Bill and with David and with Louise, but also reminiscences, unpublished writings by Bill. Uh, we tried to do as broad a range of material uh, as we could to try to, to try to suggest all the many avenues that could still be followed uh, and that might be useful for people to know about, so. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let me just answer a couple more and then we can we can wrap up. Okay. I'm getting that cue. I'm getting, I'm getting okay. <laughs> the hook is out there. Um, someone is asking, outside of his filmmaking and his role on Black Journal, did Greaves write about his political beliefs and their development? Yes, and you can find some of that in some of the, you know, Greaves' writings that we include in the book. I'm thinking, you know, initially about his piece, 100 Madison Avenues Will Be of No Help. Right. where he really breaks down sort of the racial politics of uh, the entertainment and advertising industries right. and the crucial role that um, the moving image in particular can play in rewiring like the conversation about race in America. Um, yeah, yeah, the opening sentence is, I am furious Black. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, he was, he was very there. political. He was political, but he was strategic. Uh, and Patty Zimmerman's piece on uh, Bill's Ralph Bunch film, I think is a very important way to end the book because Bunch was such an international human rights advocate kind of person. I think Bill longed for international impact. He wasn't, mm -hmm. he wasn't just thinking about uh, the local and the American, but he wanted to expand as fully as he could uh, on international issues and into broader ways of thinking. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, maybe we could just talk a little bit more about there's a question about the, the organizing of the book, kind of the how of the book, how we conceptualize, you know, an approach to a person, a career that was so broad, far reaching. Um, and I think there were just some nodes that we knew were important. So the Symbio project kind of has this core place in the book. We really That's thought cool. about previously published work. So we, you know, reached out to uh, Charles Musser and Adam Nee because we wanted to reprint as a kind of introduction, you know, um, their landmark essay on Greaves, his favorite piece of writing, from what I understand about him. Um, and then we wanted to try to cover as much as we could in terms of his, his filmmaking practice, but we also really wanted to have some significant work about, you know, other aspects of his background. So about his, um, his, his work as an actor and an acting teacher, for example. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think we, we <laughs> there were other kinds of things we wanted to include, but we knew that we wanted to at the very least, anchor some things around Symbio and then give some sense of the kind of work that led to his filmmaking career uh, and the, you know, at least as some signposts of the range of types of films that he made. Right. The, the book is, is organized more or less chronologically in terms of the work. Uh, and we, we really 
pulled out the symbio thing into a dossier, but there's a lot of work on Black Journal in the book. I mean, there were there there are evocations of other areas of the work, but there's some serious attention to a number of pieces that were kind of crucial, crucial uh, uh, additions to the career. But bottom line is it's kind of a panoramic montage arranged more or less chronic chronologically starting mm -hmm. early nice way to put it. With the last major project. Yeah. 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 And then as Scott has been saying, we really wanted this to be a take one, like a uh, kind of provocation, inspiration for further work. So right. compiling the filmography and bibliography, and I want to give a special shout out to Aurora Spears, Aurora who Spears, yeah, um, did phenomenal work in gathering that material together. Um, we knew that we wanted to have that at, at the end of the book to sort of, you know, kind of encapsulate what had been done on him before and to give people some pathways for, um, for future research. But I also want to say that starting the book off, Scott, with this set of interviews, the interview with Louise and with David Greaves, who also worked, his son, who worked as an editor with him on many projects. But before that, this brilliant work that you put together that you call a meta interview in which you went through dozens of interviews that Bill Greaves had, you know, sat for across decades. And within that put together a kind of chronology, a, a, you know, um, not exactly a biographical account, but, um, but it works in a way that I think we try to accomplish across the book, which is to have Greaves' own voice represented, right. um, his writings, his way of speaking, of thinking about himself and seeing the evolution of that over time. Um, that's another reason why it was important for us to kind of map it out chronologically right. to show that he really was an artist who was always trying to grow and learn. And he was kind of evolving in, even in the ways that he was reflecting on his own career. Yeah, and the interviews allowed us to include his thoughts about films that don't otherwise get included in the book. So mm -hmm. it was a way of, of densifying the project, uh, trying to get something that was substantive, so. Yep, yep, yep. So there's a last question from one of our blurb writers, Terry Francis. <laughs> and she's reminding that I used to teach a survey course called Redefining Black Cinema and wondering if either of us can comment on what if what we know about Greaves now redefines black cinema again? That's such a great question. Um, I mean, I was mentioning before the importance of thinking about the realm of non-theatrical media making. Right. He opens up just, I think, tremendous space for understanding how it is that sponsored filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, avant-garde film practice, that we need to layer those things into the ways that we think about whatever we're calling black cinema. Right. Um, I think that he really does get us to um, kind of recalibrate the ways we think about auteurs or our auteur desires, um, not just because so much of his work isn't necessarily kind of stamped with his name in the same way or his presence in the same way as other Black filmmakers that we have celebrated over the years, yeah. but also because he is um, just so deeply invested in um, in a different kind of uh, of business practice that 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 he really wants to create the kind of structures that will allow for like materially for other filmmakers to follow in his path. So and he's able to do that because he's crafting structures that have not been possible or had not been possible for a long time for black filmmakers in kind of the commercial realm. Yeah, I think he's also very important because he enlarges our sense of what African American filmmaking includes. I mean, right. normally we hear, oh, there are not enough roles in Hollywood films, or oh, finally a film directed by an African American coming yeah. out of Hollywood. Well, like African American filmmaking is all kinds of filmmaking. That's right. It's not just attempts to get into Hollywood, it's documentaries, sponsored documentaries, cinema verite documentaries, mm -hmm. uh, experimental work. I mean, it's like you, you've said some of this, but it's like, yeah, I think it re does re help redefine African-American filmmaking as a much broader, more complicated history than it normally gets understood as. Yeah, So television work, right? right. Like 
yeah, it really yeah. makes it much more expensive. Yeah, yeah, and those those Black Journal episodes are really interesting. I mean, I hope the book draws people back to that show. You know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, yeah, and they're being preserved. You can find those uh, online. Many of those episodes. Right. Yeah. Well, listen, right, thank Scott. you. This is thank great. Thank you. It's been great to talk about this. So grateful for the wonderful questions and for the turnout. Um, everyone especially our contributors who took the time and to thank be you here Bookstore participate. for doing this this is great that they uh, jumped on this so quickly wonderful thank you thank you hope to be hope to see you guys <laughs> take care <laughs>